morning. Hey, Amen. It's good to see your beautiful faces. If you're new to Discovery, I am not Pastor Jason. Uh, my name is Todd Howard. I am one of the associate pastors here at Discovery, and it is my honor and privilege. Come on, let's go. <laughs> All right, you're dismissed. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're, we're so excited and glad to be worshiping with you today. One of my roles here at the church is the online pastor. And I just want to give a shout out to our online campus watching this morning. All over the country, all over the world tuning in. We love you so much. Type it out in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. We're so glad that you've joined us today for this series. Uh, if, you, if you've been with me before and you've heard me preach before, you might notice that I'm holding a microphone instead of wearing a headset. And that's because I'm bald. And, uh, and, and it's a choice. It's a choice. Uh, I chose to not have hideous hair a few years ago, and uh, my forehead had become five head, and, uh, and so finally I just went for it and, and shaved it. And what you don't know uh, before you lose your hair is that your hair does a lot of things that you take for granted. And, and the first time I preached bald, I understood why people wear headbands. And I thought about wearing one when I preach, but that would look weird. And so I have this towel with me. And every time I preach, I feel like there's a pool going on in the congregation as to when that mic is going to pop off my head. Because as I sweat, as I'm preaching, it's like trying to hold on to a grease pig. And at some point in the message, that thing just pops right off my head. I'm like fighting with it and have to comment on it. And so I thought I'd just take care of that. And we'll see how this goes today. And, and you guys can, can uh, put your pool on whether or not I can hold on to the microphone and keep it on my face. But you shouldn't be doing that church anyway, so shame on you for, for doing that. Uh, I, I am so excited to be uh, in the pulpit this morning bringing the message in this series. And it, I love what I do here at Discovery. I love getting to serve with the Dream Team, with our staff, and under our lead pastors, Jason and Veronica Hanish, who are phenomenal, phenomenal pastors and leaders. Can we just give them some love and thank them? Amen. If this is the only church you've ever been to, you don't know how blessed you are. And so uh, we've been raised in church, and we, we are blessed, uh, Alicia and I, to call Pastor Jason and Veronica are pastors and to serve alongside with all of you. Pastor Jason has been bringing a phenomenal message in this new series. Here's the start of this new year. We're, we're talking about this word rhythm. And we've been in this series of practicing the ways of Jesus and what it means to be in a healthy rhythm for our lives. And we're, we're talking about different things. He's, he's talked about prayer and fasting, a, a rhythm of rest, of silence and solitude, a rhythm in God's word, and, and a rhythm in worship. And, and in every message that we're, we're bringing here at the new year in this rhythm series, it's really Jesus has modeled a rhythm, a way for us to live. And so we have to look at that and go, okay, Jesus, what are you modeling so that we can then follow you and be Christ-like in all that we do? And I'm really excited to get into it today. We're going to start with our theme verse in Matthew chapter 11. This is the message paraphrase translation. We'll read it out together. Are you tired or worn out or burned out on religion? Come on, somebody. And Jesus says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. And look, this is how he models it. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. And that stuck out to me so much the other day when I was reading it. Because we've been talking about it this whole month, and like how to take a real rest. And I was thinking about, we shut the world down and got more tired. Like, we do not know a proper rhythm of rest in our lives. And so what is Jesus modeling? And so if you're taking notes today, I want you to underline a couple words here for me. He says, walk with me. And work with me and watch how I do it. If you could underline walk and work and watch. Those three things, these models of walking, working, and watching. And we'll come back to that. It's this idea, though, of modeling or following after what Jesus is modeling for. So we continue on. He says, watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is, is undeserved gift. It's, it's not earned, it's unforced, it's a rhythm of grace. The, the rhythms of life that we model after Jesus are a gift to us. And Jesus said these words, he said, if you learn the unforced rhythms of grace, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I won't make it too hard for you. He said, keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Amen. I love that. I love that idea of learning how to live freely and lightly. So today we're going to look at some things of how to model a certain rhythm. I want to talk to you today about a rhythm of serving, about what it looks like to serve like Jesus. And when I say serving, like I feel the breaks, like 
the invisible brakes coming on. Because some of you are like, heck no. You're like, the wall comes up, you immediately started zoning out, you picked up your phone, you're checking on the scores. I mean, who's a Rams fan in this place? Eight of you, right on, hometown. Look, you might as well be a Rams fan. The Raiders aren't going, guys, so jump on board. There's plenty of room on the wagon. There's this rhythm, though, that we find in serving, and I know that we respond. Sometimes some of us are like, yes, let's serve. I'm all about it. You know who you are, Dream Team members. You're excited about it, and you're, you're ready to go. And there are some of us that we've been in church for a while, and, and maybe we feel apprehensive about serving. And honestly, the response we have has to do with two things. It has to do with our personalities and our past experiences. And sometimes our past experiences betray us because we look at those and we say, that's what Jesus was modeling and I don't want it. But just because you got jacked up somewhere doesn't mean that was Jesus' model for your life. And so we have to understand the difference. And, and if that's you today, I'm not diminishing or minimalizing that issue. If you've been hurt in church in the past or you feel like you've been abused or overused or, or maybe you said yes to too many things, man, I want to encourage you. Pastor Jason preached a phenomenal message last April in the I Don't Believe in Church series. It's on our website. It's on YouTube. Check it out about church. It'll change your life. It was such a great, great message. It's so, so fantastic of a message. But our response to, to serving has to be our response to what Jesus would want us to do. But it depends on our personality. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this word. Have you ever heard of FOMO? FOMO is the fear of missing out, right? It's anxiety that an exciting or interesting event may currently be happening somewhere else, and we're not part of it. How many of, you, how many of my people out there are FOMOs? You're, you, got, you got FOMO. You want to be invited to the party. Three of you are FOMOs. Wow, that amazes me. Y'all are liars. I just tell you right now. FOMO is this, like, like as soon as someone starts talking, hey, we're going to do this, you're like, yes. Wait, what, what are we doing? Like, you, you're in it to win it every time. You say yes to everything because you don't want to miss out on anything. And I love you. I don't relate, but I love you. And I found something that defines me better. How many of you have ever heard of JOMO? JOMO is the joy of missing out. Right? Like, Feeling completely content with staying in and disconnecting as a form of self-care. And so I love, I love how Jomo people justified it. It's self-care. It's self-care. Right? And you know who you are. You're like you say yes to an event and then you regret saying yes to it. And so then you spend the next three weeks trying to get out of that event. And your wife or your husband's like, you got to go. You've canceled six times. You're going to hurt somebody. And so then you go and you actually have a good time, but that doesn't change it because next time you're going to do the exact same thing and say yes and not want to go again. How many of my Jomo people are out there? I have found my people. Welcome. It's, it's a matter of personality. It's, it's like we, we, we don't want to say yes to too many things, and so we're, we're like, I'm good. I'm me and mine and my own. I'm good. Or maybe you're like, I say yes to everything because I want to be a part of everything. And the reality is neither one of those is a healthy rhythm for our life. Neither one. And what we do is we overcorrect. We're so bad about it. We can't find a middle ground. We can't find rhythm. We overcorrect and we swing the pendulum one way or the other. We either say yes to everything or we say no to everything. And that's not what Jesus modeled. He modeled this rhythm of walking with him, watching him, and working with him. And this is the rhythm of serving that Jesus wants us to follow. And so we have to, before we can go any further with serving, because you may be like, no, I'm not serving. I'm not interested. I'm checked out, whatever. But we have to ask this big question. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. Is God's design for our lives better than the world's? And you're at church, so you're like, yeah. But really, really consider that question for a moment. Like, think about your preferences your past experiences, your hurts, your current schedule, your education, your schooling, is God's design for your life better than the world's? Is God's design for your life better than your design? Like, are you at a point where you're saying, I'm tired of the rat race, I'm tired of this unhealthy rhythm, 
I'm tired of what I'm doing because it's not working. And so I need to find the rhythm that Jesus modeled for my life. And if that's you and you're saying, yes, God's design is better, it leads us to a second question. And that is, does God's design include serving? And it does. God's design includes serving. It's part of a healthy rhythm. And if we're not serving, we're not healthy. And maybe that's a different way to look at it than you've ever looked at it before. And maybe you're like, man, this isn't funny. But, uh, but I'll tell another joke in a minute. Don't worry. But being healthy and following Christ is serving. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28, says Jesus was talking, about his, talking to his disciples about leadership and position. And everyone likes a title. Nobody likes the work. You know what I mean? Like, you ever work with somebody that can't handle the title? Like, you know, as soon as they get the position, everybody's in trouble, right? Because they don't do any of the work, but they love to be the boss. And so that's, and if you don't know anybody like that, uh, we're praying for you. You're like, I'm a good leader. Sure you are. Okay. Jesus is talking to his disciples. They're having the same crisis. They're like, I want to be in charge. Everybody likes to be in charge, but nobody wants the responsibility. And Jesus points this out to him. He says, but among you it will be different. It's not like the world. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your what? Your servant. Boy, that feels like an ugly word, doesn't it? It's hard. In order to be a leader, you must be a servant. And look at this, that whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. Man, we need another translation because that's a, that's a rough word. And it goes on to say, for even the Son of Man, and this is, this is why we can be a servant, this is why we can surrender to it, because Jesus modeled it for us. In Matthew 20, 28, he says, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus models this idea of serving others. He brought himself low and gave up the glory of heaven and became flesh and blood as a baby laid in a feeding trough to be the savior of the world, sacrificing himself, his life, and his glory for mankind. He modeled this idea of service, of putting others ahead of himself. And we see it time and time again in Scripture. Just a few verses not in your notes. Philippians 2.3 says that we are to value others above ourselves. Romans 12.10 says that we're outdo one another in honoring each other. 1 Corinthians 10.24 says that we should not seek our own good, but seek the good of our neighbor. And if you Google verses about serving, over 100 verses will just come up right away. It's in the Bible again and again and again. We see Jesus serving when he takes up the towel and washes his disciples' feet. We see that God's rhythm for our lives is to serve others. And so if God's design is better than our design, then we have to look at our lives and say, how can I get into a healthy rhythm that includes healthy serving? And there's really three areas in our life that we serve in. If you're taking notes, the first area that we serve in is mankind. You can write next to it, your neighbor. We serve mankind. And if we're not serving mankind, we're not fulfilling the great commission that Christ gave us. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. To love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to serve our fellow neighbor. We're to serve mankind. We have to make an impact while we're here because this time is short and we'll be gone before we know it. We must serve mankind. And the second area that we serve is our family. It's so crucial that we serve our family. And a lot of times we will sacrifice family for everything else. We'll sacrifice family for ministry. We'll sacrifice family for career. We'll sacrifice family for all kinds of areas. And we forget that our first ministry is to our family. And how sad it is that we would crush it at work and forsake our family. That we would give 100% at church and forsake our family. That we would be so kind to our neighbor and ugly to our spouse. And what happens is, is a lot of times we lean into the area that we're good in and we forsake the area that we need to work on. But in order for us to practice the model and the rhythm of Jesus, we have to serve mankind, we have to serve our family, and we must serve God. And what does it look like to serve God? Like, does God need us to serve him? We serve God by serving mankind and serving our family. We, we love God 
love each other and change the world by serving mankind and serving our families. It is the rhythm that Jesus modeled that we must follow. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, the, the uh, religious Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to trip up Jesus and trick him, and they asked him this question of, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus actually gives them two. He says the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then he goes on to give them a second one. Go to that next slide for me. And the second one is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. He, he gives this instruction. He says, there are two things in order to have a healthy rhythm of serving that, that will take care of everything. Mankind, your, your, your family, and God. And that is to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might, and to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And he said the only way that we can have a proper rhythm of serving is that if we operate from love. Because when we operate out of obligation, it will not last. When we operate out of because we must and because we have to and because this is required of me, it is not a place of love that we're operating from, and we will come up wanting every time. We'll wind up resenting our kids. We wind up resenting our spouse and our job. We wind up resenting our neighbor. And we wind up resenting all of the things that were required of us, and they feel like responsibilities rather than a calling and a gifting. But Jesus said we have to operate from a place of love and that everything is anchored on these two commandments, loving God and loving each other. And so we have to have a deep, well of resource in order to love like Jesus. We have to have a healthy rhythm in our lives to really have a deep spiritual well so that we can pour out and love like Jesus. Because deep love cannot come from a shallow well. Deep love must come from a rhythm of being with Jesus. And so today I'm just going to share quickly with you four principles, four declarations, four affirmations for you and I from one story in the Bible. And it's the story of Martha, or excuse me, the story of Mary. And Mary was Martha's sister and Lazarus' sister. There's several Marys in the Bible. But this one specific Mary was Lazarus' sister, the Lazarus that died and was raised from the dead by Jesus. And we see Mary three times in Scripture. We see her in Luke chapter 10 when she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha is serving, and Martha complains to Jesus and she says, tell Mary to get off her rear and come help me serve. And Jesus does something very surprising. He said, Mary chose the good thing. And I'm not going to take that from her. We see Martha again in Scripture too, and she's serving again. Martha serves every time. And we want to say that that's admirable, but because she doesn't have a healthy rhythm, her heart is not right. And she's not operating from a place of love. Instead, she's mad at Martha or mad at Mary. So Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. The second time that we see Mary in Scripture is in John 11, and that's where her brother Lazarus has died. She comes to Jesus, and Jesus weeps with her because she's brokenhearted. And then Mary sees Jesus take an impossible situation and do something amazing and miraculous by raising him from the dead. And in this third time we see Mary, it's the anointing at Bethany in Matthew 26. I want to read that to you this morning. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. And a woman, Mary, came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw what, they, what she was doing, they were indignant. And they said, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. You know, there are always going to be people that will judge how you love Jesus. There will always be those people. But when Jesus was aware of it, I love what he said to them. He said, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. Somebody say good work. She's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, 
but me you do not have always. And then he goes on to say this, for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. It was an act of service for me. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This, this, this scene, Jesus goes into this house, Simon the leper's house, and Mary comes with her alabaster box full of costly fragrant oil to anoint Jesus, to serve him, to worship him in this moment. And there is not a place for Mary. Mary has not been invited into the house. It is an act of service that she does, and, and she does it with all of her might. And Jesus says this will be a memorial for the rest of time. People will talk about this. And if you can think about this for a moment, over 2,000 years ago, this woman that nobody knows takes an oil a jar and breaks it over Jesus and anoints him. And today from this stage, we're telling her story. As a matter of fact, her story is told in Scripture every Sunday throughout the world. And this, this one act that seems so insignificant to anyone else, it wasn't in public, it was in private, and yet it is being told forever, this one act of service. The reality is, is when we have a rhythm of serving, no matter how minute the act may be, no matter how mundane the task may be, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, what you're doing when you serve Jesus is making an impact on the rest of the world. It's making an impact. So if we're going to get into a rhythm of service, if we're going to model the, or do the things that, mo that Jesus has modeled for us, we have to understand that we have to operate from a deep well of love not from a well of obligation. And so there's four things that I want you to write down today, four affirmations from this story that I want us to take. And the first thing is that I'm invited. You are invited. This is so important for you to know. It is no small thing to be invited to the party. Have you ever been like at recess and everybody's picking teams for kickball or softball or dodgeball and you're all against the gate or against the wall waiting to get picked and you're not the first one picked. <laughs> I said always. You're not the second one picked. You're not the third one picked. You're not the fourth one picked. And you're fine until you start realizing, I'm better than that dude. Like why? Eddie? Eddie's got one eye. Like why? <laughs> the teacher? You picked the teacher? And... There's this, there's this idea that, like, you start feeling this insecurity inside of you because you're not being welcomed onto the team. You're not invited. This is what happened with Mary. She goes into the house. She goes to anoint Jesus, and immediately the disciples are like, no, 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 no. Woman, what are you doing here? Culturally, she wasn't supposed to be there. They, they judged her for what she was doing, but Jesus made room for her, and Jesus makes room for you. Regardless of your status, your past, your history, your mistakes, your shortcomings, Jesus makes room for you. I love what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He was talking to Simon and Andrew, and they were fishing with their father. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The Bible goes on to say that immediately they, they left their nets with their dad, and they followed Jesus. And why I share that with you, why that's so significant, significant is because you have to understand the history of a Jewish boy at this time. All Jewish boys would go at some point and learn under a rabbi. And they would learn his yoke or his doctrine of teaching and learn the law. And there were certain stages and ages where they would be assessed. And the greatest honor that you could hold or the greatest position that you could hold in that society and that culture was to become a teacher, become a rabbi. And at some point, all of the disciples that were with Jesus... At some point, they had stood before the rabbi they were sent to as a boy, and he told them that they were not good enough. At some point, he had sent them home. And so these two young men were working in their family business for their father. And Jesus, in this moment, invites them into the one thing they were told they were not welcome to. And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus is inviting you today. Maybe you felt left out. Maybe you haven't felt a part. Maybe your whole life you've been the black sheep of your family. Maybe you've had a hard time fitting in. And I want you to know that there is room in the house for you, that Jesus has made room. 
One of my favorite things about Discovery Church is that we always say that you can belong before you believe. We, you are welcome here. Regardless of who you are, your status, your background, we're so glad that you are here today in the house and you're invited. We do this thing called Discovery Track at, at, at Discovery Church, and it's on the first Sunday of every month is Track 1. That's next Sunday at 1.30, right after the third service. And if you're new to Discovery, we invite you to come out to Track 1 and be a part of the family. Learn what it is to be a part of Discovery. Learn our heart and our vision. We'd love to see you out there at Track 1 next Sunday. You are invited. And because you're invited, because Jesus made room for you, it leads us to the second principle and that's, I'm invaluable. You have value. You matter to the kingdom of God. More than that, you matter to God himself. Jesus affirmed Mary, and he said she's done a good work. Jesus will affirm you. In the face of dismissal, God will value you. In the face of being pushed away, God will make a place for you. John 3, 16 and 17 says it like this, and I know this is a used verse, but don't let the meaning of this verse pass you by because you've heard it so many times. This is how God loved the world. This is how much he loved us, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone, someone say everyone. Everyone includes you. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God loved you so much. He values you so much that he gave the very best gift he could give, the most precious gift that he could give, and that was his son, so that he could have relationship with you, so that he could call you a son or a daughter, because he saw value in you. The creator loves his creation not because of what you offer, not because of what you can or can't do, but because you are. Matter of fact, Paul said it like this in Romans 5, 8. He said, God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were still sinners, when we hadn't earned it, when we hadn't learned how to behave, when we didn't know how to dress, when we didn't know how church was run, when we didn't know how to say, oh, I'm blessed, brother, praise God, when we didn't know any of that vernacular or verbiage and we didn't know how to put our church smile on, when we were jacked up and messed up and dirty and filthy and our lives were in shambles, God loved us enough that he gave Jesus to die for us. You can't earn it. It is a gift of grace. It is from a deep well of love, an unconditional love that God poured out on the world because he values you. You're invited. You're valued. This third thing, I'm influential. I'm influential. When you're invited, it causes you to feel the love of Jesus in your life. And what it does is it deepens the well that you can draw from. When you're valued, it affirms the giftings and the callings in your life, and it deepens the well that you draw from. Mary understood this rhythm. What did she do? I had you underline, the, underline those three words that Jesus told us to model. She walked with Jesus. What, what does walking look like with Jesus? It means to, to be in prayer, to be in his word, to, to worship, to have that silence and solitude, to find those rhythms and practice the ways of Jesus. What is the very first thing that Mary does? She sits at the feet of Jesus, deepens the well. <laughs> what are you going to pour out if there's nothing poured in? It deepens the well. God wants time with you more than he wants you to do anything for him. Mary chose the good part, that rhythm of prayer and fasting, that rhythm of rest and silence and salt, that rhythm of the word, that rhythm of worship, it deepened the well. And then the second thing that Mary did is she watched. She watched Jesus. She had this relationship with him, and her brother dies. And he's dead for three days. All hope is lost. They tried to get Jesus to come before he passed away, but he was too late. And she's broken. She's tore up. She runs to Jesus when she hears he's in town and she weeps. And she says, if only you had been here. And Jesus in that moment, the best scripture you could ever memorize, if you ever went to Sunday school as a kid, Jesus wept. 
Give me my candy bar. <laughs> Thank you, teacher. But he weeps. And there's all kinds of theological debates as to why he cried. But he weeps, I believe, because his heart breaks for our hearts when they break. And he was broken for Mary in that moment because she was broken. It wasn't about what Mary could do in that moment. She was desperate for Jesus. And she watched as Jesus did the miraculous and raised Lazarus from the dead. Sometimes we're in situations that we find hopeless and helpless, and we're trying to fix. We're trying to make it work. We're trying to finagle. We're trying to hustle, and we're trying to say the right things and do the right things and, and borrow the right things and, and talk to the right people. And we're trying to put the pieces together, and sometimes Jesus wants us to watch because we've waited with him, we've walked with him, and he wants us to surrender to him and let him do what only he can do. So I'm invited, I'm invaluable, and I'm influential. Mary sees Jesus do the miraculous, and it emboldens and empowers her. It deepens the well of faith in her life. When Jesus said these words about Mary. He said, what she's doing today will be told as a memorial forever. You are leaving a legacy in your life. How you serve your family is leaving a lasting legacy. How you serve mankind, your neighbor, your friends, your community is leaving a lasting legacy. And how you serve those two areas of your life is a direct reflection of how you serve God. Because it comes from a place of deep love. It's not our love, it's the love of Christ. And so this rhythm of serving means that we're serving those that we get to be in life with, with the love of Jesus. And it's making a difference. It is an example for them to follow. The Apostle Paul said like this in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, remember Jesus told his disciples to follow him. And now Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. See, this is where we get to in life when we walk with Jesus, when we watch Jesus, and that well deepens, we begin to make an influence. We begin to make an impact. We begin to make a change. And so we must get to a place where we can say, follow me as I follow Jesus. And the reality is when that well is shallow and we're not drawing from that well of healthy rhythm, then we don't want people to follow us because we know we're going the wrong way. We don't want people to model our life because our model is jacked up. We're not modeling Jesus. When we come in on Sundays, we're always asking God to forgive us because we've had such a terrible week and we've messed up so many times. And it's me again, God. I'm sorry. I'm dealing with the same things. And this is our approach to God. And it's weak and it's pathetic and it's not what God wants for our lives. He wants us to model Christ so that we may come boldly to the throne of grace because we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You make a difference. You matter in this world. People are watching you. Even in the most mundane things, people are watching you, and you're having an eternal impact. You're influential. To make an impact, that's one of the things I love about our church is I talked about track one, but we also have the next step, which is track two in Discovery Tracks. We invite you to join the family. We also invite you to join the team. You hear us talk about the dream team and everyone that serves here on the dream team. And we tell story after story, week after week, of how people were impacted by a smile, by someone opening a door, by somebody out in the parking lot, by somebody that prayed with them, by somebody that taught a class, by someone that passed a bucket, by someone that gave them coffee or handed them a donut, and how it changed their life. And they're coming back. They gave their life to Christ because someone was willing to serve. If you're not on the team, get on the team. You won't get picked last. You get on the wall, you're welcomed in, you're invited. Come join the team. Next track two in a couple weeks. You're influential. You make a difference. You matter. Mary made a difference. She was walking with Jesus. She was watching Jesus. And it led her to this next rhythm, and that was to work, to serve Jesus, to do a good work. And it leads us to this fourth thing, this affirmation, this declaration, I'm invested. I'm invested. See, I'm invested because I've served God long enough to know that every time I need him to show up, he shows up. I'm invested because I know when I don't have enough money to pay the bills because I'm faithful with my tithe and offering, God makes a way. I'm invested because I know when the doctors have said there's no hope that God shows up and has performed a miracle. I'm invested because I know my father who goes before me, who's now in heaven, I will see him again one day in eternity. 
I'm invested because I know this life is short and it passes by so quickly. I can't believe how old I am already. Look at this gray beard. I don't feel old. I just look old. But I know my time is short. And so I'm invested for something greater than this life. I'm invested. Are you invested? I, maybe you've been in this place where you've been serving God and coming to church, but you don't really invest. You don't really go all in for God. You play this church game, and you're shallow. Your well is shallow. Repeating the same cycles of pain and strife over and over and over again because you just won't buy in to God's model for your life. Just go get into that rhythm. Can I just ask you honestly, what are you doing? What's it going to take? How long are you going to play the game where you're a Sunday Christian and a Monday heathen? How long are you going to play the game where you look the part but you're not really the part? How long are you going to play the game where you know the things to say but you don't feel His presence in your life? And I don't ask those questions to be harsh. I ask you those questions because I love you and I want more for you. And more important than that, God loves you so very much that he gave his very best. King David was a man after God's own heart. And his sole desire was to build a house for the Lord. He wasn't able to do it. He lost that privilege and that right, and it was passed on to his son Solomon. So David spent his life amassing wealth to build the house of the Lord passing on that legacy to his son. His whole life was invested in handing off a legacy to Solomon. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, David said, Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God. I'm invested. I've given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And then he said, My own special treasure of gold and silver. Not only was he giving what he had amassed for the house of God, but at the end of David's life, he said, just take it all. Because nothing in this world matters. What matters is eternity. Scholars today believe that that wealth, if it was today, would be somewhere between 200 and 800 billion dollars. I don't even know how to think of that much money. I got like six bucks in my wallet. And here's the thing, God doesn't really need our money. He needs our buy-in because he wants us invested. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes today for just a moment? If you're here in this house, you're listening online, and you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Christ, and you know today that God is inviting you. You need that invitation, and God is calling you. Come home. Come join the family. I'm going to give you an opportunity here in just a moment. I'm going to count to three and give you an opportunity. But I want to make it two things, giving your life to Christ, but also for those of you I feel so strongly in the house and watching online, you've been playing the game. You're a Sunday Christian, and God's asking you to come all in, to invest, to practice the ways of Jesus, to model his life and get into rhythm with him. God has so much more for you. The well goes so much deeper than you could possibly imagine. I'm going to count to three. Every head bowed, every eye closed. One, you're in this place, and you feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart this morning. Two, do not let this moment pass you by. Three, if that's you, just put your hand straight up in the air. And keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Hold them up for me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over there. God bless you in the back corner. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sis. God bless you. God bless you over there all the way over to the wall. God bless you. God bless you all the way in the back over there. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. We see you. We see you. Put your hands down. Can we just all say this prayer together? Let's help all of those that raised their hands this morning. Dear Jesus, I confess you as Lord of my life. I want to practice your ways. I want to follow your model. 
be my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, for calling me your son or daughter, for making me your own, for my value, my affirmation. Today I go all in. I'm invested. My life now belongs to you. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you, God, for each and every person in this house. For those, Lord God, that felt the call to follow you today. For those, Lord God, that raised their hand and said, I've been playing the game for too long, and I want my faith to mean something. I want the well to be deeper. I'm tired of being a Sunday shallow Christian. I want more. I want more. For those online typing in, I need Jesus, clicking that button, I'm saying yes. Father, I pray for each and every person, God. Lord, that it would take root in their life today. They would not leave this place and go back to what they were. But God, they're forever changed by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. We give you all praise and glory. Amen and amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise. Way to go.